Uh, who are you? What do you do? Why are you here? I think I'm on. Yes. Thank you. Um, why am I here? It's your fault, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, my name is Jonathan um, Lloyd. Am I too, too loud? Am I okay? Yeah. Nice booming. Nice. Well, okay. <laughs> um, um, my name is Jonathan Lloyd. I um, was born in England and raised in Nigeria. Um, grew up as a Muslim and um, worshipped Allah for a period of my life. I got into medical school, trained as a medical doctor, and uh, met some people who began to tell me that, um, unlike Allah, um, God speaks. Because in Islam, God doesn't speak to us. And um, walked into a church like this as a Muslim and walked out as a Christian. Um, many, many sure. years ago. Um, and from that moment, God began to give me a gift of dreams and visions. And I came to England on a three-month holiday in 1991. I'm still on that month, three-month holiday. <laughs> and the reason why was God began to speak to me about, about Britain and about the British Isles and what he wanted to do in these Isles and that he wanted me to be part of his move that was going to hit this out. But he didn't give me a date. <laughs> so that's why I'm still here, <laughs> waiting for God to move. Bless you. Yes. Let me, let me pray for you, Jonathan, thank you. before you speak to us. Heavenly Father, I thank you for Jonathan, Lord. I thank you for the journey that you have taken him on, Lord. And I just pray that through your Holy Spirit, you would pierce our hearts with what he has got to say to us this evening. I pray your anointing upon him now. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you very much, Doug. And I really want to thank you for um, trusting me with your pulpit and with your evening. And I want to ask this very important question. Um, can I be myself tonight? <laughs> do, do, do the A's have it or the nays? Which one? Um, can I be myself tonight? Okay, so anything I do is your fault, right? Okay. Um, I was asked to come and talk about prayer. And I feel that as, as a congregation on a journey, um, it would be great if we laid a foundation um, about prayer and what prayer means to us. Now, I know that for individuals here, we have different notions of what prayer means. Um, I, I, I don't want to be cheeky, but I, I'm not a church boy. I didn't grow up in church. And that has its advantages sometimes. Because some of the wonderful hymns that you guys know, I have no clue about them. I'm just learning them. Um, but also because um, I met the Lord before I met his wife. I don't know some of you on the don't sound I just said, but some of you met the, the wife before you met the Lord. But I met the Lord and I met him on a radical basis and I began to have a relationship with Jesus and talk to Jesus and everything I have experienced is based on the Bible and the scriptures. And so I'm gonna share with you freely tonight some of those experiences from the scriptures that I see that pertains to prayer. Is that, is that okay? Because you're all looking at me with us and where is he going with all of this? Um, but I think we have some questions. Do we? Yes, for later, yes. And I, I want to ask um, anyone that's brave enough to answer this question. What does prayer mean to you? What is prayer? Can anybody has a, a brave response? Talking to God? One answer? Anyone else? Sorry? Talking to God, listening to God. Any different? Okay. Anyone else?
praising and thanking God. Someone said? Is that what someone said? Yes. Just a voice that came from somewhere there. Um, anyone else? How about prayer? Um, can we open, if we can, does anybody have a Bible? And if you can read, um, um, I feel detached from everyone up here. So is it okay if I come a bit down? Um, uh, if you can open your Bible with me to um, Matthew chapter chapter 6. And I'm going to read a scripture to you from Matthew chapter 6. And Jesus speaking, so it should be in red in your Bible. Okay. And um, Matthew chapter 6. Now, um, when Doug was asking who I was, I, um, I grew up as a Muslim, and as some of you know, Muslims pray five times a day. And I prayed five times a day for um, a lot of my adolescent life. And sometimes after finishing my daily prayers, I would sit on my mat in the mosque or wherever I was praying, and I would look up and say to, to Allah, why don't you talk to me? And I never got an answer. And I was challenged by this, and I began to um, speak to a number of um, Muslim imams about the Islamic doctrine of God. And they couldn't give me an answer that was satisfactory. They said that um, Allah has spoken through his prophet and through the hadith and through the Quran. And everything that you need to know about what God is ever going to say to you um, or interact with you is through what has been written. And I said, well, if I can talk to you and you can talk to me, why can't God talk to me? Why can't he commune with me? Um, and nobody was able to give me a satisfactory answer. And I, I got into medical school, and, and I ran into this um, interesting bunch of people who said God speaks to them. And that got my attention. I mean, how does God speak to you? And they said, you just know that he speaks, that Jesus speaks to me. They would invite me to their prayer meetings. I never went. Onto one fateful night, I walked in, like I said, into this church. And what they were doing uh, in that, this was in Nigeria, in medical school, was they were praying, they would pray every other week or every week sometimes. They would pray from 12 midnight, they would pray into the morning. It was a tradition, it was cultural, they did it on a regular basis. As, as I walked into this, this church as a Muslim and I sat down, God began to speak to me. Now, when somebody says, how does God speak? It's a very difficult um, explanation. Has God spoken to anybody in this room before? Just join the class of the weirdos, okay? Anybody, God spoken to you? How, how did God speak to you? Through his word? Okay. Anybody else? Yes? Okay. Okay. Now, the reason why I'm asking this question is because I, I, I like to challenge Christians. I, I like to challenge the notion of what we know, what we believe. Because I only want to be around people who are authentic. Authentic in what they believe or what, they, uh, what their position is. And um, as Christians, it's good that we have an authentic relationship, in my opinion, with the Lord. And as I sat in that church, amongst those crazy guys, I just didn't understand what they were doing, um, this voice in my heart, I can best describe as a voice, began to speak to me and said to me, receive Jesus Christ, my son. And I said, why? I've been 
asking you to speak to me for a long time, and you first of all speak to me in a church. It's not fair. And God began to have this conversation with me. And I said, okay, God, you'll be my God on one condition. You will speak to me every day, deal or no deal. And I kid you not that from that moment, I began to have a real relationship with the Lord. I began to read my Bible every day. I read the scriptures from Genesis to Revelations and back again. I was just, I was just so hungry for this, for this God. And to, to go along with that, I began to have a number of experiences with God that were based on the word. And I, when I began to read the book of Acts, for example, and I, and I read in the New Testament that God would actually speak to people like Paul or Peter and others in dreams or visions or directly. Um, I wanted that. I wanted a real relationship with God, not a nominal one. And that's why I asked you to open to, um, to, to Matthew chapter 6. Can somebody read Matthew chapter 6 and verse 9 out loud so that um, actually... Um, not verse no, no verse verse six actually, verse six of Matthew chapter six. Anyone? Yes. For you, when you pray, enter into your closet. And when you have shut your door, pray to your father who is in secret, and your father who sees in secret shall reward you openly. That is Jesus speaking, and he, he, he said to the disciples that there are a number of things that you do. When you pray, make sure you get into a place where you are not disturbed. Get into a place where your mind can focus on the Lord. And so when he says, go into your closet, He's basically saying, go to a place where, um, it doesn't mean that you need to find a broom cupboard to, to pray, but it just means that you need to find your space that no one or anything can interrupt so that you can have this direct communion with God that... Um, does this work? Yes, sorry. I just was going to press it. Can you help me, God? Okay. It's the wrong scripture. Is it delayed? Is it delayed response? Sorry? Yes. I think so. Yes. Pray. Let's pray for it. <laughs> okay. Um, um, so when 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 we when we when we're praying, we need to find that place that only God has access to our lives and our hearts, and we need to find a place that um, He can commune with us, and he can speak with us. Amen. And I know, is this, I, I've, I've been to many churches to, to preach, and sometimes I try to be careful what I say because um, I don't want to, I, I don't want people to pigeonhole me or for me to be detached from them because of what I'm about to say. Everything I'm going to tell you is not because I'm Nigerian or I'm black or you think I'm Pentecostal. <laughs> Everything I'm about to tell you is because I love Jesus. And I believe that what the Bible says is true. It does what it says on the tin. Amen. And so if the Bible says lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. 
it means it. <laughs> Amen. If the Bible says, ask and you shall receive, okay, seek and you will find, knock and the door will be open. They are the words of God. And God was not saying that, and he's not schizophrenic. He means what he says, and he says what he means. And I believe that the Baptist tradition is, uh, is a high view of Scripture. Am I right? Am I in the right place? <laughs> Am I among friends? Yes. So, it means that we believe the Bible. Yes or no? Good. So, it means that if the Bible, the Word of God, um, projects something or say something, it means that we can take it to the bank. Hallelujah. <laughs> okay. Got work to do tonight. Um, okay. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. Um, so it means what it says, and it says what it means. Go, go, go to the next verse. I, I'm, I'm not even sure where we are. Um, Get, get to the next one, please. Okay. Next one. Okay. Yes. All right. So, when you pray, go into your room, and when you have shut your door, pray to your father who is in the secret place, and your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. It is true. Let me, let me try something charismatic. Can you look at your neighbor and tell him or her, the Bible is true. Okay? So, I want you to look at somebody else and tell them that is a true statement. Go on, look at someone else, tell them that is a true statement. You see, this, the, the point I'm making here is this. Um, if the world is going to know that God is real and he's alive, we have, he has to have a group of people who believe in him. Amen. If you're going to, if, as a salesman, if you're going to sell a product and sell it well, you've got to believe in the product. And the, 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 the apostle said this, he said, the apostle John said this, he said, what I have seen, what I have seen, handled what I know, what I have felt, is what I am passing on to you. Amen. You can only pass on to others what you have experienced. If, only, if your only experience of God is head knowledge and, and the knowledge of what you've read from others or from, um, um, from a text, that is all that you will pass on to someone else. But I began to realize that when I prayed, like one of your archbishops said many years ago, he said, when I pray, coincidences happen. And when I stop praying, they stop. <laughs> Hallelujah. I, I remember one day I was praying, dog, and um, you're the only person I know here, so let me mention your name. <laughs> I was praying for something, and I was on the um, east, east end of London on Backing Road. There's a, there's a road called Backy Road in Eastern London. And I was asking God, God, should I do this project or should I not? Because on one hand, I'm thinking I should. On one hand, I'm thinking I shouldn't. And as I sat there, this big double uh, decker, uh, decker bus, red bus, drove past. And on the side of the bus was just do it. Coincidence? Why was it at that point in time when I was praying that that bus chose to go past? Are you with me? Okay. Now, what I'm saying, what I'm, what I'm trying to say to us is this, that God uses everything to speak to us. He uses situations. He uses people. He uses his word. He uses dreams and visions. Um, he uses uh, 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 your conscience. He uses some kind of um, um, uh, 
some people say sixth sense or a, a, a hunch in your heart, you just know that you should do this. And sometimes you actually hear God speak to you. Amen. You're not weird if you hear voices. <laughs> Are you with me? Paul, on the way to Damascus, heard the Lord speak to him. Why are you kicking against the pricks? And he said, fell on his face and said, Lord, what should I do? Are you with me? God speaks. So can you do something very un-British tonight? Can you shake the person, just push them a bit and tell them God speaks, okay? Go on, just tell God, God speaks. I'm serious. God speaks. Amen. In fact, can we, can we, say, can we say that together? Say, God speaks. God speaks. Oh, my God. Let me, let's try that again. <clears throat> uh, uh, one, two, three, go. God, God speaks. speaks. God speaks. God has spoken through his word. God has spoken through his prophets. God speaks through prophecy. God speaks through dreams. God speaks through situations. Hallelujah. I'm sure by the time Jonah had spent three days, by the third night, he had said, God is enough. Okay, I get the message. Are you with me? God speaks. Even Pharaoh that did believe in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, by the sixth or seventh plague, he said, look, I get the message. All right, you guys want to go? All right, let's strike a deal. God speaks in various ways. And in our contemporary times, it doesn't mean that God has stopped speaking. I woke up one day, and this was just very early, within a few days or maybe a week or two of um, becoming a Christian. Um, in fact, when they laid hands on me, I found myself speaking in this strange language. I didn't understand what it was. But when I went to the Bible, I, I discovered that the people, when they prayed for them and they received Jesus, they began to speak in some kind of um, heavenly language, it was called. And so I had the experience, and then I read the Bible and found out what the experience was. For example, I woke up one day, and this was in 1986. How many years ago was that? Almost 30. Um, I woke up one day in my medical um, dormitory, and this was long before mobile phones. When my parents would come in, they would write a letter to me, or they would have to come to the office and they would have to ring um, a, a telephone and somebody would have to come and fetch me or look for me or whatever. And I woke up one day and I looked at the clock and a voice in my heart said to me, your parents are going to walk through that door at 12.47. I said, really? Okay. So I tidied my room, got rid of all my Bibles, the Christian material, but I didn't want my parents to know that I had become a Christian. So I cleared out everything that, was, that looked like a Christian, that had Christian material in it. My mom and dad walked into that room at 12.47. Coincidence? I don't think so. And um, my mom was so impressed with my room. <laughs> and I thought, this new religion has benefits. <laughs> I can use this. Seriously. And, and and um, I, I remember that God began to give me um, um, dreams and visions. And, and these, are not, these are not esoteric you know, dreams or visions. These are all based in the scripture. Everything I do as a believer, ever since I've met the Lord, has to be tied to the Bible. If it's not tied to the scriptures, forget it. I don't want to have any experience or had, have any thought that it doesn't have a scriptural premise. Amen. So I'm not asking you to um, um, begin to hear voices or do things that don't have a biblical basis. Hallelujah. So you can't 
look at a beautiful woman one day and think, oh, a voice said to me, you should be my wife. And she's married to someone else. It doesn't make any sense. It's not scriptural. Are you with me? So what, whatever God will say or tell you to do has to line up with the Bible. Hallelujah. Are you with me? And the scripture is saying, I wish this was working. Um, basically, is that when you, are, when, you, when, you, when you really want to connect with God, try to find your space. Amen. Do you understand what I'm saying? Find your place. Everybody has got their place. Some people, it's in the swimming pool or in the shower. Something with you and water just make you hear or remember or you have imagination. So for some people, it's running. Some, for some people, it's walking the dog. For some people, it's sitting down and listening to relaxed um, um, gospel music or um, quiet music. For some people, it's just reading through the scriptures and things begin to make sense to you. Everybody here has to find their space and their pace. And you cannot base it on anybody else. And so when I read the scriptures, when I look at the Bible, I found out that there are people like Ezekiel and um, Jeremiah who have this very, and John in the New Testament, weird experiences. And the Lord took me onto this high hill, or the Lord showed me a burning um, pot, and he says, what is that? And they're having this dialogue with God. Now, not everybody, everybody here is going to suddenly hear, oh, dear Sally, my lovely daughter, I have a message for you. you know, not, not everyone's going to hear a voice, a booming voice, but everybody here can find a way by which God speaks with you. Hallelujah. Are you with me? And if we can understand this principle, it will make us hungry or hungrier for how God wants to lead us. One of the things I also discovered about God is that he doesn't make sense a lot of the times. <laughs> Amen. I said God doesn't make sense a lot of the time. Um, how many of you have watched um, Kings and Exodus, or Exodus and Kings, whatever, that movie out about Moses? You don't watch movies here? Okay, sorry. Um, <laughs> um, anyway, the latest, the latest story about um, the, 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 the Exodus from, from Egypt. Now, God leads the, the Israelites to the Red Sea with the Egyptians behind them. And then when the Egyptians, oh sorry, the, the in, according to the scriptures, maybe not according to the movie, but according to the scriptures, um, the, 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 the children of Israel, including Moses, are crying out to God, God, what are we going to do? And he says, why are you crying out to me? Go forward. <laughs> Hello? <laughs> God, you said go forward. All we can see is sea in front of us. Do you understand what I'm saying? God doesn't make sense a lot of the times. And I discovered in the scriptures, he says, um, my thoughts are way above your thoughts. My thinking and my ways are above your ways. So, in other words, when God wants to do something, he says to Peter, Jesus says to Peter, on a boat, he's on the sea. Peter says, is that you, Jesus? And Jesus says to him, come. Now, according to physics, every weight displaces its space and weight in water. So, stepping out of, boat, of, of a boat onto water does not make any sense, does it? But thank God Peter wasn't thinking when he stepped out. Because if he was thinking, he wouldn't have done so. But he steps out and he's thinking then catches up with his actions. And he, think, he thinks, what am I doing <laughs> walking on water? I should be walking on water. And then he begins to sink. Hello, are you with me? Jesus wants to feed 5,000 people. 
and he says to his disciples, go and give them something to eat. And they said, look, we don't have, he said, what do you have? Five loaves, he said five loaves and two fish. I keep forgetting this thing. Is it two loaves, two loaves and five fish? Can, can someone tell me? Two fish and five loaves. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so five loaves and two fish. And he says there are 5,000 men here, not counting women and children. Let's feed them with this meal. You must be crazy. One um, McDonald's meal for this whole church. You can't be serious. But he says, bring it. Are you with me? God doesn't make sense. Let me give another example. I read my Bible, and God wants to save the world. And he wants to send his message to the whole world that he has come, and he has come to save mankind. I would think God will repeat what he did with Moses, with Jesus. Just make sure that um, Jesus arrives in Caesar's palace because there is an effective communication system to the whole world through the Roman Empire. Hello, are you with me? No brainer. Are you with me? Are you here? If you want to communicate something to the whole world, you use an effective communication strategy. Okay? But God chooses to hide that in a manger in a small town called Nazareth. Makes no sense. Do you agree with me? No, you're all looking very strange. <laughs> so when you read your Bible, and that is why people who are brilliant and intellectual can knock our faith, because a lot of things that we read and the way God acts many times is contrary to culture and contrary to the way people behave. But yet, that is the way God behaves. So what am I saying? Number one is that God speaks. And number two, sometimes when he speaks, what he's asking you to do may not follow conventional wisdom. So be ready for some interesting instructions coming from your prayer life. Hello. If everything you're hearing God tell you to do makes sense, it just might be your brain. Hallelujah. So, I feel that one of the basics of, of prayer is that we find our secret place. And in that secret place, we will find God. In Mark chapter, in Mark chapter 1, in Mark chapter 1, is that the next verse on there? Nothing seems to be working tonight. Um, in, in Mark chapter 1, 35, it says, And in the morning, rising up a great while before day, Jesus went out and departed to a solitary place, and there he prayed. The context of this verse is Jesus comes to Peter's house, sees a relative of his who's ill, heals her, and the whole house begins to get healed. And they were having a healing revival up to late in the night. And many people began to bring other people the following day for Jesus to heal them. But before they arrived, Jesus had woken up and gone, to some, gone out to a place, and there he prayed. Amen. And by the time he finished, everybody was looking for him. The meeting was ready to start, and they said, Jesus, the people are looking for you. And then he says to them, we are not going back. We're going to other villages. What do you mean you're going to other villages? Jesus, you have started a revival, and people want to see you. But what do you mean we're going somewhere else? We're not going back. And the reason why he says we're not going back is because he has spent time with God. Are you with me? So in other words, what Jesus instructed or told those guys was contrary to conventional wisdom. I can go on and on. Lazarus, your best friend. Jesus, you pray for everybody you pray for gets healed. Your friend is ill. Can you go 
and pray for him. And Jesus stays put. He doesn't move. You've got a best friend in, in what's the hospital here? Sorry? Ken and Canterbury. Okay, you've got, you've got, you've got a friend in, 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 in intensive care, and they ask you, Come, let's go and visit, let's go and pray. You say, no, I, I, I can't. And then when, when you find out that the person has passed away, you say, okay, let me go and visit now. Are you crazy? Are you, do you follow me? So the point I'm making is that the way the Lord will lead you as a person who is following Jesus is going to be sometimes contrary to conventional wisdom. And if we always follow our intellect and what we feel is the right thing from our minds and don't find out what the Lord is saying, we will miss God. Hallelujah. How many hours do I have? <laughs> um, we've gone around um, thank you Jesus. I keep reaching for this thing. I keep forgetting it's not working. Um, could you go all the way up to the top with the pictures? Um, if you can. If you can go all the way to the top of the, where the pictures are, where Wembley, where the Wembley pictures are. Um, when I first came to this country many, many years ago, um, I was praying in my, in my room one day. And I, I don't know whether it was a vision or a dream, but I was in a stadium. And it, this was 91 or 92. And it was a massive stadium. And I knew it was Wembley. And it was filled with Christians praying and worshiping God. The pulpit was empty. And in the vision, I knew that Jesus was going to show up and talk. And the Lord said, when my people gather, I am the one that speaks. I had no idea what the vision meant. But I knew it was Wembley, but the Twin Towers were not there. It, was, it did not look like Wembley Stadium. This was 1992. And so I shared it with a few people. I said, I saw a stadium. It was Wembley Stadium, but it was different. And then I forgot all about it. Ten years later, Wembley Stadium was demolished. And a new stadium was built. And they projected the new stadium on the screen. Do you have my picture? Thank you, Jesus. Okay. I've become against this conspiracy. Um, and I, I saw this stadium, and I screamed. I said to somebody, I've been in this stadium. I said, 10 years before this stadium was built, I was in it. I said, one day, somebody is going to hold a prayer meeting, and people are going to pray and worship God in that place. On the 29th of September, 2012, part of that vision, in my opinion, was fulfilled. Because Wembley was filled with Christians worshiping and praising God. Are you with me? Now, I, how, did, how did God project um, a Wembley Stadium vision to me in 1992 for what was supposed to be taking place in 2012? How did he do it? The same way he showed John what was going to happen at the end of the age. When you read Revelations, you see things that are going to happen and are happening, part of which are happening now in the world that John had 2,000 years ago. Are you with me? God is amazing. God can project into the future. He can bring you into the past. And he can tell you things that you would never have imagined. Because he is God. Hallelujah.
Can we say hallelujah again? <laughs> Maybe something will happen. Um, do, you have other, do, do, you, do you have other pictures? Thank you. Um, go forward. Thank you. Go forward again. Uh, next one. Yes, next one. Yes. That was Wembley Stadium, 2012, September. Now, can you go back? Can you go back? Um, go back again, please. And one more time. West Ham Stadium. Okay, go back again one more time. Yes. West Ham, the first prayer meeting we held Global Day of Prayer was in 2006. It was at Westminster. Do, do, does anybody know Westminster Chapel? Yeah. We held it at Westminster Chapel in 2006. I'll just give you an example. I'm telling you what I've experienced. So I'm not, you know, giving you theory. In 2006, we held a prayer meeting and we had just over 1,000 people gather at Westminster Chapel. And just as we were about to start the, um, that meeting, the Lord told me that we should go to West Ham Stadium. So when we finished and we had this wonderful meeting, um, it was June, it was Pentecost um, weekend of 2006, I went back to the meeting, our, the steering group meeting, and we were talking about what we were going to do the following year. And I said, the Lord impressed on my heart that we should go to West Ham Stadium. Before I could get the word stadium out of my, my, my mouth, Everybody in the room fainted. I'm joking. Um, but everybody's mind shut down and said, Jonathan, we don't do stadiums. We don't do stadiums anymore. And if we're going to do anything, we should do something um, in, another ch in another church that is slightly bigger than West Westminster Chapel. And we can fix something that can fit 5,000 people. So I left the meeting a bit frustrated and I went back to the Lord. I went back to my secret place and I said, God, the group of people that you brought to help me with this mission of prayer, because I set it up, I said, I've said, we cannot go to West Ham Stadium. So the Lord said to me in prayer, this was, this was, a, this was a dialogue, he said, tell them that you will take a stand in West Ham Stadium. I checked and found out a stand sits approximately just under 5,000 people. So I went back to the meeting, um, maybe two weeks later, and I said, why don't we, I think this is my name, said the Lord said. I said, why don't we just take a stand in West Ham Stadium? It sits about 5,000 people. They said, yeah, that, that's, that's doable. So we booked West Ham Stadium for 5,000 people. And when we had the meeting um, at West Ham Stadium, 24,000 people showed up. Are you with me? Now, what I've just told you in a nutshell does not in any way give you a good picture of the challenge of faith and the challenge on the mind between what God said and the, if the actualization or the results manifesting. It took a lot of faith and a lot of prayer to make it happen. Why am I saying this? I'm saying that God is going to tell you things and speak into your heart that the people around you are going to scoff and say, oh, do you want to set up a shop on the high street? It's not going to happen. But you know in your heart that you receive this in prayer. Amen. And if God gives you a vision and a dream, and an instruction, go for it. Wow. Are you with me? Because anything that God tells you, if you believe it, will happen. 
You know why I know? Can I tell you why I know? It's because my Bible says to me that this world was made out of that world. And that everything that we see, this is Hebrews 11.3, everything we see was made out of what we do not see. <laughs> Hallelujah. Oh my God. Am I losing you? So, okay, let me put it this way. There is an invisible world and there is a visible world, okay? The invisible world is more tangible, substantial, and solid than the physical world. Everybody in this world is forever young. There is no law of entropy in this world. You know physics, the, um, the, the laws of physics or the laws of science means the minute you are born, you begin to accelerate towards your death in this world. In this world, it is life forevermore. Oh my God, are you with me? Praise the Lord. I'm losing some of you. How many of us believe in angels? Do you believe in angels? The Bible talks about angels. Okay, read your Bible. In other words, you don't see angels, but they are real. Hallelujah. Are you with me? They are very real. They are very strong. And the world they come from is more tangible than this physical world. That is why if you pray, when you pray, you stand between the spiritual world and the physical world. And anything God shows you about the spiritual world in your life, you can pull it in to your physical world. Amen. Hallelujah. Do you understand what I just said? Let me give you an example. Elijah was told that it was not going to rain. And it stopped raining. And then God told him it was going to rain. And so he went to tell the nation that it was going to rain. And they had this spiritual contest on a mountain called Carmel. And the um, priests of the pagan god were pitched against the god of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And guess who won? And then, on that mountain, Elijah says, I can hear rain. And he, te he tells the king, you just go ahead. I'm going to go up to the mountain. And Elijah goes up to the mountain, and he prays in the rain that he hears in the spiritual world. He prays it in to the physical Hallelujah. Are you with me? Prayer, E.M. Bounds, one of your authors said, prayer is work. Prayer is labor. Huh. Thank you, Jesus. Are you with me? When you hear things, when God tells you things about the future, you have to pray it in. You have to declare it. You have to say what he says. And then you will see what he sees. If you don't see, before you see, you may never see. I'll repeat that. If you don't see, before you see, you may never see. Paul said, I pray that the eyes of your understanding may be opened so that you can know what is yours in Christ Jesus. Is this tracking us now? So all of this stuff God had in his heart, but he just needed a group of people who would believe to make it happen. 
what is it that God has said about Canterbury Baptist Church? Who is seeing things about this church or about your life or about this community? God wants to tell you things that you can pray in. Hallelujah. Now, you don't have to pray like a South Korean out loud or like a Nigerian bouncing up and down. Just pray the way you know how to pray. Are you with me? But make sure you know what you saw. Make sure it's biblical and believe it and you will see it. Hallelujah. Are you with me? Because that is one of the secrets of Christians. They are able to know what God knows, agree with him, and then they can pray it. That's why the prayer of the Lord is, thy kingdom come on earth as it is where? In heaven. Amen. And the look on Doug's face is saying, Jonathan, your time is up. Am I right? Click on.